and it's going to be a great, exciting program, and I'm, I'm really thrilled they asked me to be a part of it today as moderator. But before we get started, we're going to play a brief video uh, to show you exactly why we are here today. Throughout history, women have been at the forefront of change. Women are leaders, artists, thinkers, inventors, revolutionaries. Women have pushed boundaries and answered the call of duty. From voting rights to civil rights, women have been there, standing up, making a difference, challenging our world to be better and do better. When Rose Blumkin founded Nebraska Furniture Mart in 1937, she challenged the world. Sell cheap and tell the truth wasn't just her motto. It was a challenge to businesses everywhere to put the customers and community first and make integrity a foundation of your business. And as we celebrate Women's History Month, we think about Mrs. B's advice. Set your goals high and don't really have what you would call a top. You should go for the heavens. Because women's history isn't only about where women have been, it's about everything women choose to be. Support solutions that help Texas women and girls thrive. In addition, Texas Women's Foundation is an acknowledged leader and advocate in the gender lens investing movement and has deployed 100% of its assets, endowments, operating investments, and donor advised funds in a gendered impact portfolio that yields strong financial returns and social benefits to women and girls. And 100% of the proceeds from the ticket sales for today's event is going to the Texas Women's <coughs> Foundation. Um, before we get started with our questions for the panel today, and I have a, a lot of pre-prepared questions, but the last half hour or so, uh, we're going to open it up to any questions from you today. So hold your questions. I'm sure you'll have many, but we'll get to those towards the end of today's program. But before we get started, we're going to just go down the line, starting with Leah, and have everyone introduce themselves to you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, hi everybody, my name is Leah Frazier. I am the CEO of Think3 Media. We provide creative marketing and communication services for startups and small businesses um, now all across the nation. I've had a very colorful journey from being an attorney to a fashionpreneur to now running my agency. And I think I'm good for now. Something may happen tomorrow and we'll have a new title, but that's what it is today. That's great. Um, my name is Beverly Bass, and I'm a retired 777 captain with American Airlines, and we fly jets. <laughs> um, I'm still flying today. I fly a private jet that is owned by an 84-year-old woman who still works full-time. Howdy, everyone. My name is Leslie Hassler. I am your Biz Rules Business Coaching, and what I do is work with women-owned service-based businesses to get scaling and growth right in a way that's profitable and a heck of a lot easier to do. Um, like Leah, I have had quite the adventure. Started off marketing and advertising, agency side, went into interior design and construction, into business coaching, and yes, it does actually all relate together. But I, I agree, um, this is my playground, this is where I was meant to arrive, and um, have big visions and plans for that. Thanks, um, my name is Amy Myers, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Nebraska Furniture Mart, Omaha based, but come down here a lot because I'm actually also Grandscape Chief Marketing Officer, so thanks. And hello, my name is Megan Berry Barlow. I run the HR function for Nebraska Branch of Art. Um, I am also Omaha based, but I feel very disingenuous if I don't um, let people know the truth. I'm a native Texan. I was born here at Parkland Hospital. Um, grew up in Corpus Christi, is where I consider home. Um, I'm also a professor, so have a lot going on. And I just have to say, I'm so fired up to be in a room where I don't know everyone. Like, we've been doing the quasi quarantining stuff for so long. It's just really nice to be like, oh, I'm in a room with a couple of strangers. So <laughs> I feel like we're headed to head back to normal. So it's good to see all your faces today. And I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Kelly Raspberry. I've been with the Kid Craddock Morning Show on Kiss FM. Uh, this May will be my 27th anniversary. Sometimes I forget how old I am. But um, in addition to that, I have a podcast I do twice a week with my husband called A Sandwich and Some Lovin'. And the Love Letters to Kelly segment on the Kate Craddock show was so popular, we've started doing a podcast for that as well. 
So got a lot of things going on, but um, also my Emma Kelly and the online business, Leah and I were talking about that earlier. That's a little on a pause right now, but we're hoping to get that fired back up now that things are starting to get a little bit more back to normal. But I'm thrilled to be moderating here today. We have some great questions for these women. And again, we're gonna open it up for your questions at the end. But uh, we're gonna start things off. My first question, and let's just start with Leah since you're right here. Um, is there anything you believe needs to be changed in the discussion around diversity and inclusion in your industry? Um, in my industry, I do a lot of media and PR. And so one of our biggest discussions right now uh, surround cancel culture. And I am a big proponent of when things happen and, and, and it's a really tough um, conversation to have with diversity and inclusion. Um, but I am a person that believes if people are willing to try, have the conversation, um, put particular steps in place um, that maybe they're able to have a second chance and to rebound from that. So I hate seeing that there's companies that we have had to help with communication strategies, particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement or making sure that there are not enough women in leadership so that they can have that voice communicated on social media. I hate to see when certain brands or companies that are actually trying to do the right thing, they just didn't have the right people in leadership to propel that through, that they are 100% canceled <laughs> without giving them the chance to actually rebound. So I would like to see moving forward, um, that now there are some that should be, but for those that are really trying to, like from an HR perspective, bring in speakers, you know, do things that boost employee morale, um, that make steps for talent attraction, whether that's to get more black people in leadership, black women in leadership, women in leadership, taking those steps behind the scenes that maybe you publicly can't see on social media, and really just giving people the grace to make improvements so that we can better you know, survive as a society, that's what I wanna see, and that's what's kind of been tough in the DNI situation, is that we're behind closed doors really trying to help people to rebound or reshape and get the right people um, in those positions, but the pace that social media just runs through and digitally is so hard, and it's really putting a lot of people out of business and out of jobs. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Some things are being done, like you said, behind closed doors. But if you're not putting it on Instagram and Facebook, how, how are people supposed to know about that? And I think, Beverly, I think you are really a good one to answer this question. Do you think, I mean, because you broke a lot of doors open, down, ceilings crashed in your industry. Do you think anything needs to be done to be changed in the discussion around diversity and inclusion in the airline industry? Well, I only have one airline to talk about, and that's American, because it's the only company I've ever worked for. And I retired in 2008, so obviously things were quite a bit different then than they are today. And I do know that they're very focused in hiring a diverse group of the population and as a matter of fact, um, I have a short press release that I'll read to you. It was August 18th, 2020. American Airlines has been named to the Diversity Best Practices 2020 Inclusion Index, which recognizes top companies and organizations engaging in effective practices of diversity and inclusion. This is the first time American has been named to the D. BP Inclusion Index. So I thought that was quite a nice recognition for them to get. And I do talk to a lot of my colleagues today, and they constantly have classes and uh, study programs on diversity and inclusion. In my day, that was not something we had any part of. So that's been a, a really good change. So American Airlines has actually done the work in yes. your experience. Yes, That's good. For sure. Now, asking, um, I guess we'll go to Leslie next. Do you remember a specific experience of where you wish that you or your organization or your industry had done something differently? And if you were to do it over, what would you change? 
So I thought about this question. I've been an entrepreneur for 14 years, so I uh, live by no regrets. So I don't personally have them. But I thought about a story that was really one of my last um, employment stories. And I was pregnant with my second son. It was month eight and a half when I found out I wasn't going to have a job. And the reason was, as I worked for another small business, and he said, well, I can't be without somebody, so you don't have a job. And it really was heart-wrenching because small businesses of a certain size fall under the radar. And so there wasn't anything legal or that I, you know, I could take a complaint to. Um, and I had to train my replacement. And I think at that point in time, of course I was angry and, and mad, but you know what I did? I trained my replacement. And while on a certain level that's good human, on other levels, I should have turned in my keys and walked out because I accepted the behavior. And I think that's really one of those things that we all individually have to do. In small businesses, it's not like we have HR departments or training departments or you know, diversity and inclusion. It comes down to our individual behavior and our individual expectations. So it's really being kind and saying, I understand you're scared, but your behavior is not acceptable. And explaining why and being willing to walk out the door. And I think that's the courage I didn't have 14, 15 years ago that I uh, would not hesitate to exercise today. Yeah, it does take a lot of courage to take a stand. Do any of you ladies have a, a situation where you wish you would, could go back and get a do-over on it? Um, I do have a short story. Yes. Um, and I was hired in 1976 with American. And at that time, there were three female pilots. So we represented one half of one percent of the pilot force and you know we were, the three of us were single weren't married you know weren't planning to have kids right away but over the next couple of years that of course began to change and our regulations at that time actually stated if a female pilot becomes pregnant it's grounds for termination i know and the younger pilots just cannot even believe that that's what the regs said at the time but fortunately, we went to the chief pilot, had a meeting with him, and said, you know, we'd really like to get this changed, and this is why. And within two weeks, that reg was changed. So we felt like, you know, they listened to us, and we made great progress. And the female pilots today, not only can they get pregnant, they can fly, I think, for maybe six months or something. So that was a huge change and American adapted beautifully to it. Although, we still don't have a maternity uniform. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing the things we just take for granted sure. now that you had to fight for 10 years ago or less. You had something, Leah? Yeah, I was thinking, I was like, well, what do I have? I'm not a pilot. Beverly. Um, but I, I have talked openly about my journey when I was an attorney, and at the time, there was the big natural hair. I don't want to say it was a movement. I want to say it was always there. It just wasn't widely recognized. And I practiced in federal court, which was very polished, and you can only wear black, blue, and gray. And I never followed the rules. I either had red shoes or animal print build, whatever. And so when I started to grow my hair out naturally, I was told that I couldn't. Um, you won't be taken seriously. Your hair like this is a distraction. If you're talking to the judge or if there's a jury at the time, they only need to focus on what's coming out of your mouth and not everything else. And I'm like, well, why does she get to, to like, your hair is a distraction? It's red, you know? And But it was just like, no, you need to slick it back and put it in a ponytail. Okay, if you have what I was born with, when you try to slick this back, it fights you back. It says, no, this is not natural. So you end up using like half a tub of gel just to get it slicked back and then you put in a fake ponytail. It was the worst. And I wish at that time, because um, I was just thinking, I was just this baby attorney and I was fighting for my voice. I looked like a kid. I had absolutely no respect for men. 
and I was just trying to save my job and I did it and looking back I was like man I really wish I would have went in there like Arr. you know and I didn't but now Leah you know all these years later you can't tell me nothing um, but I you earned I, that I earned I mean, we it we were all starting out we could probably all say we did something we wish we could go back and do different. But. I just wish I would have networked and found other women who were going through the same thing so that I felt more comfortable in who I was and um, in fighting for what was right. Now, I know, Leslie, um, you said you have a follow-up to the previous question. By way of comparison, do you remember something you've done, something you wish everyone was doing, and why? I think one of the best things I've done for myself is develop my leadership skills and my communication skills. Um, and now I think the proper phrase is emotional intelligence. I think we are in a pivotal moment. We've had a year of pause that has accelerated so many things that need to break down and be rebuilt. If we're going to do that, we're going to stink at the conversations. We're having to forget words, um, change how we approach a person. We're having to change so much of our social norms that we grew up with, all of us. And I think we need to give each other, Leah, you mentioned this a lot more, um, a lot of grace, a lot of compassion, and understanding that it's through those difficult conversations that we're actually going to meld something beautiful together and it's not about you or me it's about us and we're not going to do that by not having the conversation so work a little bit on your communication skills ask for forgiveness if i know i'm going into a difficult conversation i'm like i'm gonna flub this up but i need to do this will you give me grace to make a mistake and then that just totally disarms people and you really can have good, honest, open, productive conversation. Well, Leah kind of touched on the subject of you wish you'd found a mentor, so I'll ask this of Amy. Um, was there a female mentor that you looked up to? How do you find a mentor? I remember one time a woman actually offered to be my mentor, which I thought was, well, was kind of refreshing. She saw something in me. She said, that I, you need help. I'm going to mentor you. <laughs> so did you go out and actively seek a mentor? I did not, and I, I, I didn't really, I think there's a lot more formal mentor programs now, and I've taken the opportunity to kind of set people up. But I, what I did have is people, men and women, that were willing to take a risk on me, and were willing to give me opportunities that I, were a stretch. Because I don't mean opportunities that you're ready for, because those you're fighting for, and you deserve those, and, and that should be you know what you expect. But those people that look at you and say, you know, she's not quite ready, but I'm willing to give her a chance on this and put her in this role. Um, and I had men and women who did that, and it it's, makes a huge difference in your career when you can find those people and, you know, seek them out and kind of hold on and let them guide you a bit. I'll show you, you're gonna regret this decision. I did my presentation, and that was that. And I think we have to have that mindset sometimes of trying to turn that into a positive and remembering that there's other people that are probably looking at you and the actions that you take and try to open some doors for some folks behind you and be that one that just shows up continuously. Now, a lot of times for young women starting off in their careers, uh, we said it takes courage to speak up and a lot of them haven't developed that courage. So what would you tell young women today who are just at the start? They're graduating college. They got their fresh little resume in their hand. What would be your advice? Uh, yeah, you know what? I was, when I was thinking about these questions, we all just some prep work, and it, it reminded me that, so I'm into human resources, and I know human resources really well, and I can go to a lot of different businesses and do human resources and lead human resources. But until you have the business, the core of the business you're working in, um, that's how you really become a valuable asset. So if I had to stop and try to learn retail, which I don't have a retail background, um, which then the practice of HR is very different. Like lots of hiring, we talked earlier about turnover. Um, you know, people that work on the weekends and at nights, things that I wasn't accustomed to in the way I practice HR. 
So learn the business that you're in, in addition to whatever thing you know with your brand new little resume. And you know you, but make sure you know the business as well. Do your research. Do your homework walking in. Leah, I, I have down here that you had a story that you would like to tell women at the beginning of their careers. Did I write that down the wrong? I wrote that down on the wrong question. You did it. I did. It was just a tip. Oh, okay. Like I said before, like I've had many different <laughs> careers, uh, but I think something I would tell people is don't be afraid to take pivots, our keyword, right? Sometimes we graduate with a degree or we go into a career and you feel like that's what you have to do because that's where my skill set is. That's what society expects of me. That's what family expects of me. And you don't. Life is beautiful. It's meant to be enjoyed. Um, you find what brings you joy and figure out how to make that work. And when I was younger and coming up, because I had six figures in law student debt, it, I just felt like I'm pigeonholed for the rest of my life. And that's not true. You can go and do whatever you want to do and be whoever you want to be. And life is meant for you to keep you know, riding that wave and figuring out who you are and making it happen. Yeah, my thing is when um, young women or even young men, they, they don't have to have it all figured out the minute you get your diploma. I mean, I was living at, my home, at home with my parents, working three jobs at 27. And because I'd gone to school, got my degree, but I was still kind of floating and not really sure what I wanted to do, but I was still doing something. And I think that's the thing, just do something. I know a lot of these young people just sit around and like, well, I just won't do anything until I find the right thing. No, do something and do that thing well because you never know who's going to walk in your door. But um, it was 27 before I got my job in Dallas and it ended up being my dream career. But at the time, I felt like a 27-year-old loser living at home with my parents working three part-time jobs. But, you know, I was hustling. And I think that's the, the tip I always give people. Don't, you don't have to have it figured out the minute you graduate because... I mean, I bet a lot of us didn't even use the degrees we graduated with, probably. Or maybe you do in some way. No? <laughs> now, the next question, I think Beverly can really well speak to this, but I, um, Leslie, I think you can as well, because you said you worked some in the construction industry as well. So what did it mean to you to be a woman in that industry? Because that's typically considered a male industry, right? It just is interesting. Like when I started my first business, it was, I call it an accidental entrepreneur. I found out on Wednesday, I wasn't going to have a job by Monday, and I was really tired of that because um, I did good work. I just worked for small businesses that always struggled with cash. And so I, there wasn't, it wasn't a consideration because everything I did, the only people I saw being successful were men. So it didn't. It wasn't something I consciously thought about, and it was interesting because um, pre-COVID, I remember going to a new networking meeting, and I was the only woman in leadership in the room, and I was like, "Wow, it, this has been a while since I've been the only other person on, you know, that leadership level in a room." Um, I don't let it intimidate me. I've been called honey, sugar pie, sweet. Well, let me tell you how it works. Really? Um, I'm like, oh, you mean like this? So I think I always come at it with a, a position of strength. I'm not going to back down. It's not who I am. It's not within me. Um, but I do recognize now working so much ex pretty exclusively with women business owners that shift and that difference and that it can be intimidating but I'm enough to walk through the door and that's all I need and I think that's really all anyone needs to succeed and we can't not ask you this question Beverly what did it mean you were one of the pioneers of female pilots what did it mean to you to be a woman in that industry you know I guess I was one of the pioneers but it's so hard for me to think of it like that and I remember when I was brand new, uh, you start out as a flight engineer on the three pilot airplanes. And the two pilots would turn around to me and say, you really are a pioneer. And I'm like, not really. I mean, maybe, maybe 50 years from now, I'll be able to feel like a pioneer. But I still don't feel like a pioneer. Um, I just, I do realize that we were certainly uh, on the cutting edge of flying for the airlines. When I got hired by American, there were 16 other women that were flying for the airlines in the United States. 
And um, American treated us beautifully. They didn't make us dress in the men's uniforms. We actually had a female pilot blouse. We had a female hat. We actually looked like girl pilots, which was so new at the time. And every cockpit we walked into, the guys had never flown with a female pilot, but they were great to us. And I think more than anything, it was curiosity. They weren't against us. They knew that we had to have the same qualifications as them to get hired. It was just they'd never flown with a female pilot. And once they learned that we could do everything the way that the guys do, they respected us and they were great to us. Um, one of the things I hate people to ask me is, oh my gosh, you've only worked with men. I bet the guys were horrible to you. No, actually, the guys were great to me. And as my daughter will say to me today, she's also a pilot, as is her husband. There are a lot of pilots, are they? <laughs> now that I think about it. She said, Mom, you always say, if you demand respect and you respect who you're working with, you will get respect in return. And she said, that's true. So I don't have any horror stories about working with men. As a matter of fact, I was more concerned about the flight attendants and their acceptance of me because I had never worked with women. So, you know, all my flying days before American, I was the only female pilot at Mission Airport in Fort Worth. I was the um, first female co-pilot with American, the first female captain, and the first female instructor. So I'd only been a captain for two years, and I'm training men who have been with the company 30 years. You know, I was a little intimidated, but they were so wonderful to me that I, I don't have any horror stories. I just um, Yeah, I don't think that's, you know, a lot of women do have horror stories, but a lot of women don't, right. <laughs> you know, and right. I, I'm in that same boat too. I feel like... A lot of times, you know, men can be our big champions as well, and you need some good men. They say behind every good man is a strong woman. Well, behind every strong woman is some pretty supportive, supportive secure men, That's right. right? That's very true. Because it takes a lot to be married to women like us or to be our partners. Just <laughs> our husbands. Yes, exactly, because, you know, my, my life is very public, and my, I'm on my second marriage, but my husband's like my biggest cheerleader. In fact, I'm, <laughs> he always says, get it, babe, no matter what I'm doing. You get it, babe. So we got a get it, babe shirt made for me because he's <laughs> always my cheerleader, right? And sometimes we go out and I'm getting all the attention and a lot of men don't like that. But he's a good partner and we all have to have good, good men to support us as well as the female mentors too. But um, let's talk now about what we've all been experiencing for way too long and that's COVID. Um, it's taken a, a large hit at the need for the human connection we've been craving so much. So now more than ever, it's important to find power in women collaboration and uplifting each other no matter what the industry is. So through collaboration and abundant support of each other, women do blossom. So since you work in human resources, and we're talking about human connections, Megan, how do you define the best space for women to support one another and their businesses? Thank you. Um, first off, I, you have to value individuals. You know, you have to really get to know someone and commit to the time to know somebody. Um, but I, I wrote a little note here. So at Nebraska First Front, we have five female executives. Amy is one. Um, and we refer to ourselves as the Fab Five. Not necessarily out and about, like we don't have Fab Five t t shirts, but maybe we should. We're missing. Um, but I'll tell you what, it's really nice because there was a while in that executive team when it was just me, and it was not as much, it wasn't fun. I didn't have that type of fun. So I feel like what we have done as a female group of um, leaders of the business, we've really tried to amplify one another. So we have, we'll have, we'll be in a meeting and Amy will be talking about some technology to do something in marketing and measure people and trends and I don't know, like I do people, right? Um, but you know what I always say, like, out loud, I say, I use my voice, and I say, oh, way to go, Amy. Like, that sounds like a great program. Anything just to amplify another female's efforts in a business environment, to me, goes a long way. So 
again, it's easier to do when you do have a personal connection with people, um, but just amplifying the voices of others um, is critically important. Good tip. I like that. Now, Amy, since she just referred to you, have you ever experienced exclusions towards yourself or witnessed it towards others in your industry? I have, and you know, I use this example because I think it's, it's a pretty flagrant one, but I think there's a lot of more subtle versions, but this was not at NFM, although it was more recently than I'd, I wish it was. Um, and it was a situation where I was at a company and we were buying a pretty major like e-commerce services type contract, multi-million dollar contract. And so when you're doing those type of contracts, you have these vendors coming in and presenting and, you know, they present multiple times and so they get to know you and your team and you're, you know, whittling down to the last final people that you're going to deal with. And the COO at the company, who was a friend of mine and male and probably 15 years, you know, older than I was, um, was asking me some questions about it. He said, he was just curious, it's a big spend. And, um, and I said, you know what, this vendor's doing their final presentation today, just come on over. Come on over and sit through it, you know, you'll be, he, and he was just interested in learning. So he came in and sat down and, I mean, there were probably 40 people in the room. I don't think he, you know, said a word, because um, he was just learning. And again, this vendor had presented to us multiple times. At the end of that meeting, that was the final presentation, they went back to their offices and they sent the contract and the quote just to him. Just to him. He had nothing to do with anything. He wasn't my boss. He wasn't the, you know, he, he, but he was the male in the room, the older male in the room. And, you know, he sent it back and said, what do you, what do you guys do? What, you know, and, and this is the, when you know you've got a friend, um, he was like, what are you guys doing? This, how did you even get my email address? I had nothing to do with this. Um, and so that kind of, you know, just assumption that if there's a male in the room and, you know, he's, he's, he's the decision maker, he's the secret decision maker. They may not have announced it, but really he's the one, he's the one or, or they wouldn't have brought him in. And, um, and I ended up, you know, I mean, we were going to go with that contract because it was the best one, but I ended up presenting to their sales team, the entire company. They flew me out to New York and I talked through that experience and like how, how detrimental that was. Um, to the relationship, to how I thought about them and um, what they could do differently as a sales team. Does anyone else have a story they'd like to share about feeling excluded or? I can add a yes. little bit to that. Beverly. Um, I never felt it at American, as I've expressed previously, but in order to get hired by the airlines, you have to fly for many years before that and build thousands of hours of flight time. And so it was very hard for me to get flying jobs, especially in Texas <laughs> back then in the early 70s. Um, my counterparts on the East Coast and West Coast were flying much better airplanes and had much um, better jobs. But I would apply for a corporate job and the owner of the airplane would say, gosh, we'd love to have you and you have plenty of experience in the airplane, but." but we just can't have a female flying our executives. I mean, what would their wives think? And I'm like, I don't care what their wives think. I just want to fly your airplane. So my first flying job ended up being flying for a mortician. I flew, um, I went to college, I went to TCU in the daytime and flew bodies at night. So that's what I was relegated to. <laughs> And the airplane was so small that you could only fit one body in at a time, and they weren't on the stretcher. So the body would be here, and I would have to climb over their face to get to my seat. So that was my first flying job. They got better after that. <laughs> How could they not? <laughs> they never complained. My wow. passengers were great. Right, right. You did wow. perfect. <laughs> I never thought I would hear that story. That was, that was incredible. All right, so let's talk about our careers now. So I'm gonna ask the ladies, um, let's start with you, Leah. Uh, what motivated you to pursue your career field? You, Like you said, you've sampled quite a few, but you started off with law, right? I started off with law and started having crazy dreams about uh, fashion. I was watching a lot of Rachel Zoe on Bravo TV and how she was styling for the Oscars and I was like, I wanna do that. But <laughs> what drew you to the law career first? Uh, to the law career, again, I'm just flighty. So I had, I was supposed to be a cop. 
I went and took the civil service exam. I had a degree in criminal justice. And right before I graduated, my professor said, you're very good with communicating and like arguing. I think you should go to law school. Okay, so that and, was just at somebody's then, suggestion. Okay. Yeah. And so I did that. It was great. I was an amazing attorney. I love my job. And then the whole fashion dream started coming. And I just set up this small little hobby on the side for all the attorneys in um, my law office because they came to my office every day. It was like a fashion show. What are you wearing today? Where did you get that? And sometimes you just don't want people to wear what you're wearing. So I was like, well, I'll just shop for you. So I went somewhere else, you know, made them look fabulous. And it was changing their lives. And so I started blogging. And then I was getting calls to come on TV. So I was trying to do TV fashion segments and get to the law office at the same time and hope that they didn't watch Fox. <laughs> and it just blossomed. I, was, I started going to New York Fashion Week. It just, everything just started coming really, really easily until I moved here to Dallas and the fashion scene was like on 10. So when I got back here, my business blew up and I couldn't do both at the same time. So I took a leap of faith and realized that there was an issue in the marketing of our fashion designers and our retailers. And I'm like, I built my whole career by posting everything on social media, by being a journalist and being on TV. I know all the producers, the editors, these small guys need a chance. And so I started Think3 Media and it blew up from there. And we just totally focused on fashion and beauty the first year. And then I was getting called from liquor companies and banks and authors. And I was like, wow, everybody needs what we're doing. And I expanded and I haven't moved since then. So five years in, we're good. <laughs> I've not had it left. Something else. <laughs> until, yeah, until something else, that shiny penny. And I'll pivot again. Now, Beverly, when you were a little girl, did you have dreams of being a pilot? When did you get bit by that bug to fly? Uh, I was four years old, and uh, I grew up in South Florida, and my parents used to go across the street every day to have cocktails with the neighbors. And I'm an only child, so of course they coded me along with them. And they had a statue of Icarus, and he had the wax wings with feathers, and I would sit there as a four-year-old and study that statue. And back then, I wanted to physically fly like Icarus. It had nothing to do with the airplanes. And so we would go back home, and I would climb up on the washing machine. And if you can imagine this, our washing machine was in the kitchen. How weird is that? But anyway, I'd climb up on the washing machine, and I would jump off trying to fly across the room. And of course, I ended up in a heap on the kitchen floor with bruised knees. And then when I was about eight, I would beg anybody I could to drive me out to the local airport. And back then, you could actually get pretty close to the runway. There was a chain link fence. And I would just sit there. I would want to stay for hours. And about 9 o'clock at night, National had a jet that came in from Tampa to Fort Myers and I could pick up this landing light way out in the distance. I would follow it down to touchdown, and I would hear those jet engines rumble in my stomach, and I would look at those pilots in the cockpit, and I thought, yep, yeah, that's what I want to do. And, you know, I'm sure my parents just thought they had a, a weird kid, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I came out here to go to college at TCU, my first summer home. I got my car, I went to the airport, took my first flying lesson, and then when I got home, I announced to my parents that I was gonna fly for the rest of my life. And back then, I didn't know in what capacity because there was no such thing as a woman airline pilot. So what I said to my parents then proved to be true since I'm getting ready to be 69 in a few days and still flying jets. Do you have a date like, my husband and I are already talking about retirement, and we got a ways to go. Do you ever think about retiring? Do you have a, well, a certain you date know, I, in I mind? I did retire from America. Right, but as a pilot. Okay. <laughs> so I've retired once, but no, I want to be the oldest woman jet pilot. How much longer do you have to go? To I don't know. <laughs> but no, I still. It's love inspirational. It. Now, uh, Leslie. What would you tell your younger self? I know your career probably took a little, you know, a lot of twists and turns uh, unplanned when you were let go because of your pregnancy. 
looking back now, how far you've come, what would you tell the younger self before you even started your career path? I would first say you're enough. Think about things and destinations. We give things fin finality. Like I must be everything to, in order to be this. And it's just not the way life proves to be true. I'm still learning how to be a great mom because I have a 16 year old and a 14 and a half year old. <sighs> And I love them. But you know, if you have kids, you understand you're not in control. And I, I do walk around a lot, and even in business, COVID, howdy, not in control. But what I can do is control how I show up. And so I think had I heard that earlier enough along, I don't think I would have been as scared. I don't think I would have been as nervous. I would have given myself permission to get some skin and knees and bumps and bruises and some heck of a good time along the way. So I just think we have to give ourselves that grace, if, especially if we're gonna give it to others. Um, but there's a book you know, that I'll have you read because if, if Leah's story is, is similar and we've had varied experiences, it's called Range how generalists succeed in a specialist world. And I read that book and I was like, oh, heart song. Because I have journalism to interior design to business coaching and you learn along the way. Um, and I couldn't give up any of those experiences because I wouldn't be who I am today. So you're where you are for a purpose. Show up, get through it. Learn, move on, create something new. That's so, that's so interesting about the stories here because someone like Beverly, who's known since she was four, and you've stuck to that career path, and the rest of us have kind of bobbed and weaved and done what we had to do, but I think we're all success stories sitting up here today. Now, Amy, you are successful now, but it was there ever a time where you're like, this ain't working, I'm ready to give up. I don't tell this story very often, so... I'm oh, good. In front of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, my first job out of grad school, so it was like the first, you know, professional job at a professional company. It was a very good insurance company. I was living in Chicago, um, and I quit after a week, which I look back now, and I'm, like, horrified that I did that. It was the right decision, but even now, I'm like, how did I have the nerve to do that? But... Uh, the one thing I've always done is make sure I liked the work and I got a sense really quickly that I didn't like the work and I've, I've used that I don't have a five-year plan but I always kind of go towards things that I like and enjoy doing and um, that I, I could sense it right away and you know thankfully my my husband was willing for me because I didn't have another job yet I mean this was still <laughs> coming right out um, but I, I you know, ended up leaving that, and which led me into my first job um, at a retail company, which I really ended up enjoying, and kind of set me off on that path. But uh, yeah, I, I took a hard face plan on that one and opted out. Pretty yeah. Quick. <laughs> well, when you're younger, I think you can take those like risks because you don't have as many. Like when you get older and you have the mortgage and you have the kids and you've got braces and stuff to pay for, it's kind of hard to walk in and say, I don't, I don't feel this. I'm quitting. But when you're young, you can't afford to take those chances and risks, and it paid off for you, obviously. Megan, did you ever have a point where you're like, this is, I'm on the wrong path, this is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah? This is a great story, too, because it is like utter failure, like on rapid time. So when I graduated from high school in 1987, I got accepted into, at, at the time, there was only two degree programs in the state of Texas for sports medicine. And it was funny because I, I, and I, this is just a side note here, but I think sometimes asking 18 year olds to like, pick what you're gonna do for the rest of your life is insane. Yeah. Okay, so I'm a doctor, right? I'm also a nonprofit fashion preneur. I've learned that because of Leah. I had no idea that's what my abundant closet was about. But um, so anyway, so I, I get into the sports medicine degree program, and I think that's gonna be my job. I went for, one day. I was one of nine students in the state of Texas that got accepted to this program and I went for one day. Because I got assigned to the boys baseball team, I saw more male uncovered than I'd seen in my entire life. In one day, they had, the, does anyone remember coaches shorts? 
double-knit polyester. They have these two big snaps on the side. And unlike the airlines, they were not meant for women. So I had these long, ugly double-knit shorts and this white collared shirt with the big bobcat right here. And I hated it, so I didn't go back the next day. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do because I was 18. And my mom called me and was like, um, hey, they're looking for you. Like the university is looking for where you are. I'm like, I can't do it. And so I, I, I use that story a lot more with young people, but I think it's so relevant at any age really is, you know, I thought, okay, I don't, I don't know much about me. I know that I'm a jock and I like sports, so that's what I'm gonna go. But if you look at me now, there's clearly more to me than just being a jock. Um, and so I guess morphing that into another question I'm just kind of, you know, I, would, I hope that young people could learn how to spend time introspectively. That's difficult, and I'm 52, and I'm just now really doing it. Um, it's like, what does make me happy, or why did that make me angry, or why am I sad, or what, where, where am I missing you know, pieces of my life? And it's harder to do when you're 18, 19, and 20, but I think if we help facilitate that for young people, that some of those career decisions that you're making when your brain's not even fully formed um, would be a lot easier. So yeah, one day in my career field. And then I, of course, had to go to Gen, gen Ed, and then I scrambled to find another career. I landed where I should have landed, for sure. But man, it was a rocky 24 hours. <laughs> well, was there ever like this, um, this critical turning point for you in your career when you're like, this is, I know this is it. I've, I've landed on it. There's like a magical epiphany moment for any of you like that. A real turning point for you, Leslie? Coming from the interior design business, you know, I spent two years in what I call conversations with God, where I was like, okay, if it's not this, then what is it? And getting the nudge to go to business coaching, and um, I didn't feel qualified. I didn't feel like I knew enough. And so I did three clients for free for three months. That was the deal. And talked about what I wanted from the relationship and we got done with it and there were three completely different businesses and I had impact. And I was like, oh, I can do this. And um, it took me two years to get to that point and it was just, like I've said before, this is my playground. I don't work, I joy, you know, in so many different ways of what I do even on the really hard conversation days. So. It just sometimes it's that risk of doing it that, and not being afraid to say no, this is not it, and being okay with going and figuring it out. And some people would say, never give away your expertise for free, but you were trying to build a business and get your name out there and your reputation, and it ended up paying off for you. I wasn't giving it away for free, I was giving it away for confidence. Mm. And there's a difference there. Like I knew what and why I was doing it. So there was a strategic intention. I wasn't just, okay, I'll do it for free. You know, I was very clear um, with my clients and with myself why I was doing it, so. And they ended up keeping you on after that three months? No, no, no. But still you had the tools you needed to know that I can do this and move forward. And I had a better understanding of who I wanted to work with and how to market to them. Yeah. So, but it was a valuable experience. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Oh, interesting. All right, so what is the question you're most tired of hearing on the subject of being a woman in this industry? Because I know, Beverly, you get it. <laughs> I mean, that's every panel I've ever been on with you, it's because you were a groundbreaker as a woman in your industry. And you know, what the rest of us do, I mean, women have than our jobs before, right? So what are you just most tired of hearing on the subject of being a woman in this business? Uh, probably when people say to me, I, I didn't know there were women airline pilots. Still? Like, oh yes, we've been around for almost 50 years now. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they still say it. Um, you know, my daughter who's a captain for Envoy, they still say it to her and she's like, my mother did this 50 years ago, you know. Are we just not paying attention when we're leaving the plane? I we're all just. I think that's it. And I also think when we, as the captain, make a PA, I think they think it's the flight attendant a lot of times, you know. But I would like to mention a pivotal time in my career. Do you mind if I back up? Please. Okay. okay. Um, for me, it was 9 11, and I was uh, the captain of a 777 and was one of the 38 wide-body airplanes 
that was diverted to Gander, Newfoundland when they closed all of the airspace on 9-11. And we were treated so beautifully by the people of that small community. There, it, was a, it had a population of 9,400 people. We showed up with 38 airplanes unannounced in three hours. We had nearly 7,000 passengers and crew, and we stayed for five days and the, the stories of how wonderful they were to us have now been immortalized in a Broadway musical that is still on Broadway when COVID allows things to open and it's called Come From Away and it's a beautiful story about our time in Gander during, during the worst time in American history. Is there a book written about that as well, or is it just the Broadway play? Um, it's the Broadway play, and they are going to make a movie. A so, movie as yeah. well. Yeah. Are you consulting yeah. on it? They there are actually five casts in uh, four countries on three continents before COVID that played to a uh, sold-out house every night. Yeah, it was going to be passing through Dallas. We were talking about that earlier. It right was before actually COVID. playing in Dallas when it shut down yes. because of COVID. So hopefully they'll come back and start it up in Dallas because all the equipment is in storage here. They just left it. How <laughs> <laughs> about that? Yes, they'd like to start here. Is there any other... Uh, of the other ladies that would say, just, you know, the topic of being a woman in this business, let's just let... Let's just let that go. Are you tired of hearing anything? I have a different response to that. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a conference, a leadership conference, and one of the people in the audience asked, they said, you know, I'm always having to tell my team X, Y, and Z. When do I get to stop? And the guy stood up there and he goes, you know, that moment when you think, oh my God, I've got to say this again. And you're like, I'm going to be sick if I say it one more time. He's like, that's the moment that you're just getting through. So that changed my thought process on some, what I would call the Bill Ingvall, here's your sign questions, um, because I don't want to shut down the conversation. And so I'll answer any silly question you ask a thousand times if it gets the message through. And we have way too many people, way too many channels, way too many voices, way too many things demanding attention for everyone to hear it if I say it once. I think a lot of times just because we know something, we assume everybody knows it, but especially in my business, I just assume everybody knows what's going on with Britney Spears. And I'm like, how do you not know this? Yeah, it's like, no matter what it is, I just assume everybody knows, then you have to remember, oh, you have to keep answering the question, right?